Good morning, Facebook and YouTube. This morning, on the 14th of July, we're doing a Devo from uh, Chuck Smith's Word for uh, Wisdom for Today, entitled, The Days of Noah. Uh, but first, let's go through some of the activities here at the church. As you know, Sunday morning, uh, we have a morning service at 8.30 and 10.30 where children's ministry and nursery are provided. Uh, prayer meeting in the sanctuary at 6 in the evening that Sunday. Then Monday, the July 18th, is the next ladies' breakfast at Uncle Bill's. That will be at 8.30. And then Monday night will be Freedom Through Christ at 7. And Wednesday, it alternates between Conifer Village and Cape Regional. So the next meeting for uh, Cape Regional was last week or yesterday so it would be on the 27th and then the conifer village also at one o'clock will be on uh, the 20th of july and then uh, wednesday night we have a bible study and i believe we're starting in the book of esther uh, so that'll be at seven o'clock then thursday morning like we did this morning at 7 30 men's breakfast at the flight deck that's uh once a week uh, if you're there at 7.30, that's great. Sometimes we meet earlier, but 7.30 is a good mark. Uh, Thursday, 10.15, we have a devotional, also on Facebook and YouTube. Friday morning at 9 o'clock, we have a men's study. Uh, we're starting in, I believe, uh, 1 Corinthians, so it's, that's a great book to go through. Women in Prayer, 10 o'clock. And then 11 o'clock on Friday morning will be another devotional. The Sight and Sound coming up on August 9th. So anybody that hasn't already put in their uh, uh, reservation with money, uh, that's due ASAP. And then uh, from August 15th to the 19th, we have Vacation Bible School. Then August 21st, we will have Baptisms on the Beach. So that's a lot of things to look forward to. Okay. Starting in the days of Noah, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And that's in Matthew 24, 37. In the days of Noah, God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. It is not hard to make a comparison to today. Our world is full of violence and corruption. Television and movie industries pollute the minds of people until the thoughts and the imagination of man's heart is only evil continually. And just as in the days of Noah, people eat, drank, marry, and carry on their business without the thought of the soon coming of the Lord. The world can't continue on much longer the way things are, spiraling ever downward. A day of reckoning approaches and nothing in the world's arsenal can save us. Education won't save us, neither will science, the government won't, the United States, or no, I'm sorry, United Nations won't, and not even Greenpeace can save the planet. The only sure hope for the future is the return of Jesus Christ. He alone has the power to save and to deliver. As we see the deteriorating conditions of the world around us, we shouldn't get discouraged. Instead, we should be motivated. We need to rise to the challenge and live lives that are godly, righteous, and holy as we wait for the return of our Lord. Father, as we look at the world today, we see the same conditions that existed in the days of Noah. 
and we realize that judgment is not far away. May we humble ourselves, pray, and seek our fa your face, and may we turn away from all wickedness in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so looking at the days of Noah, uh, I'm sure you probably heard this story. This is a little ways back, but on April 13th of 1970, the Apollo 13 mission was on its way to the landing on the moon. They were 200,000 miles from Earth and experienced an explosion in the command module's oxygen tank, tank number one. The actual phrase was, Houston, we've had a problem. But of course, it got transposed a little bit and it says, Houston, we have a problem. Well, we have a problem and it's the wickedness of man. Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually. In Genesis and Jeremiah, they speak of the heart of man. In Genesis, it says, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And in Jeremiah, we read the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? With the long suffering of God, Noah built the ark and it took him about 120 years. It had never rained before, as we know it today. The dew would come up from the ground and nourish the earth. So here are these people watching Noah build the ark, asking, what's rain? And they look at him and goes, and you're building a boat? By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, was moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Eight souls out of that entire world were saved. The number eight, just his family, his sons and his wives and their wives. And who was it that closed the ark? God closed the ark himself. It says, so, the, so those that entered, male and female, of all flesh went in as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And I, you probably know the number 40 actually represents the number of judgment. And God was judging the earth for the wickedness of man. So as in the days of Noah, the people ate and drank, married until the day Noah and his family entered the ark and the floods came and destroyed all those remaining. So bear in mind the scoffers, even today, but the scoffers were asking, what are you doing? 120 years of Noah preaching and not one person except for the eight were ever saved. And they say, where is the promise of his coming? Sounds familiar. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And that's in 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4. So isn't that what the world says today? Acting as if God doesn't exist? Therefore, they cannot be held accountable. They willfully forget the judgment of Noah's generation by the flood. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Will you be ready? Will he find faith on the earth at his return? And again, in 2 Peter 3, 9, we read that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And regarding the promise, the promise is only as good as the one making the promise. And in Ezekiel 33:11, we read, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? 
So here's God's compassion. He didn't want anyone to die, and he always gave them a forewarning. None are righteous, no, not one. We're all sinners, saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Man attempts to fix the sin, yet there is nothing in the world's arsenal that can or will save him. This is a spiritual battle, not fought or won in the flesh. Man's worldly wisdom in education, in science, in government, in worldly organizations is not a, w a wisdom that can save us. Only the return of Jesus Christ, for he is more than able. He alone has the power and authority to deliver us from our root problem and cause of our condition, sin. In Acts 4.12, we read, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And in both Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, it says, you shall have no other gods before me. What do we have before, before God? What kind of gods do we have that take our time and our energy that should be going to, to the Lord? Because the things in this world are going to fade, but if we invest in the kingdom, they're gonna be everlasting. Our hope is in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jeremiah 29, 11 gives us some comfort. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And then Paul admonishing us in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, living for Christ, doing those things that please the Father. And being holy is being set apart for Christ completely, holy. What is acceptable to God? It says in Hebrews 11, 6, faith. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. And in not being conformed to this world, but being transformed, like a butterfly from a caterpillar, a new creation. The renewing of your mind, no longer being a slave to body appetites, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The evidence of what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, the complete will of God, having no other gods before him, loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, humbling yourself before God and allowing him to lift you up, occupying until he comes. The question is, are your lamps full? We're not to be surprised at his return. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So we are to be investing in the kingdom of God. And in Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. You, his people, are called by God. Yes, you are called by God. We are called to humble ourselves. We are called to pray. We are called to seek his face. We are called to turn from our wicked ways to, to repent. And then he says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. So these I wills are the promises of I am. And again, remember, the promise is only as good as the one making the promise. So he says to us, I am your peace. I am your provider. I am your shield, your buckler, your protector. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true vine. 
God is sovereign and he is long suffering. He forewarns of judgment and he offers salvation. He makes a way when there is no way. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our advocate to the Father, shedding his blood for the remission of sin, our sin, once and for all. Our place is to humble ourselves, to pray and seek his face, turning away, going in the opposite direction of the sin that so easily besets us. If you have drifted away, finding yourself far from land, taken out by the undertow of compromise and sin, know that Jesus is the way back. For those who have never repented and asked Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior, this is for you. By confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Again, that is a promise. Now, that may sound too easy. Well, know this. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You cannot earn your salvation, and you cannot pay for your salvation. And it's interesting, in Acts 8, 20, Peter came across a man called Simon, that while he was watching the apostles lay hands on and the Holy Spirit being given, offered them money. And Peter said to them, your money perish with you because you through that, you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. So the Lord invites you. In Isaiah, he says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Thoughts, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. For John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So I pray that you pray that prayer, that you ask Jesus Christ into your life, that you confess him as being Lord and believing in your heart, that God raised him from the dead and you can be saved. Take that, to, take that seriously because the times are short and we need to do that in our lives. So God bless you. If you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. And we'll be glad to help you out. Pray with you, give you a Bible. Um, but we thank you for taking the time. In Jesus' name, amen.